everyone. Welcome back to Morning Cup. I am so excited today because I have John with me. John Beeman currently works as SVP of strategy at the Elvor Club, where the firm helps small businesses succeed through supporting services and VR technology. Prior to joining the Elvor Club, John attended Liberty University, where he majored in business administration with a concentration in economics and duly enrolled for his MBA. During this time, John worked at a private equity company where he helped build multiple businesses in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex, served on the city council, and still serves as chairman of Roy's Ch City Chamber of Commerce. John lives in Rockwall County with his wife, Nicole, and their four fur babies, Sasha, Ollie, Simon, and Theo. My dog's name is Ollie, too. <laughs> Welcome, John. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Caroline. It's truly an honor to be here. I'm so excited to have you here today. I know when we first chatted, I knew we connected and I was like, I have to have John on. <laughs> I think we you know, look at things the same way, especially when it comes to small business, you know, with your background and everything, there are so many overlaps. So it's, it's a lot of fun. Yes, it is. And I would love for you to dive into your journey in a nutshell, and then we can dive a little bit deeper as well of how you got here today. Perfect. Fabulous. Well, I started my career uh, at a private equity company, started off as an intern, I uh, got promoted to junior analyst studying and researching the oil markets specifically. Mm -hmm. After about maybe a year and a half there, I got a call from my employer, my uh, supervisor. Mm -hmm. He's like, hey, we've been watching you, like what you're doing. Um, you're going to help us, but no more oil research now. You're going to help us start, build and sell a, a small company within two years. Ready, set, go. I was like, whoa, a little bit of a shift here, <laughs> but we had fun with it. We got it done in a year and a half, got a five-star rating, um, one of the home, uh, home advisors top um, company in Rockwell County the summer of 2015. Uh, after we sold the firm, I went back into analytics and research and I got promoted to senior analyst. And then an opportunity came up uh, to get a little bit of equity in a uh, franchise company yeah. as well in the DFW marketplace and merchant processing. Uh, so took the opportunity and built it up over the course of four years. We were very, very blessed. Got a good, strong um, headquarters, we'll call it here in Rockwell County, kind of branched out. Even though we can work nationally, we definitely focus on the DFW market. And then in the summer of 2020, right smack dab in the middle of the COVID pandemic, mm -hmm. um, got a call from the top franchise, you know, you know, the founder of the firm. He's like, hey, we've been watching what you've done. We, we were very blessed. Uh, we outpaced the rest of the country. We had the fastest growth. We were the largest portfolio at that time, still to this day. Um, he's like, hey, we've been watching you, enjoyed what, you, what you're doing. I'd love you, for you to be a part of this nonprofit that we're starting. I was like, wow, I'm honored that you think of me. Kind of tell me a little bit about, you know, what, what exactly is this nonprofit doing? And in a nutshell, it was something to support small businesses, specifically with fewer than 20 employees, um, really along the lines of strategy consulting. And that's, you know, with my academic background um, in economics, my MBA, the things that I've done in the private equity world, it was a very smooth transition. It was right up my alley. I was like, helping small businesses? Count me in. I, I can't turn that down. Um, so we started that in the summer of 2020, relied heavily on virtual officing. We used, I think it was Verbella at the time, um, and start off with strategy, but an emphasis on strategy. But as we onboarded with clients and started helping people, what we found was that almost every client we had, the conversation would go like this. We'd be like, tell us about your, um, your KPIs. They'd be like, what's a KPI? Like, no worries. Let's, let's take a look at your business plan. Oh, I don't have one that's okay. Let's look at your financial statements. And they give us like three-year-old tax returns. And we're like, okay, we're going to have to go back to basics here. <laughs> yeah. And that happens so often. We started running focus groups and we're like, how can we truly help the small business out there? And as we went down that path, we quickly found out they needed less help on the strategy side and more help on the overall basic framework, the structure of the company. I think maybe the number was about 12% or so of businesses that we acquired or rather serviced only 12% had a business plan, a marketing plan. They knew their avatar and they had a budget. You know, the remaining 88% or so didn't have any of those core fundamentals. And we we're like, wow, that, that needs to be, we need to address that. So we pushed hard, I made a lot of strategic partners. We're, uh, we acquired maybe 1,100 clients or so, got a database of over 3,000. And then fast forward to the fall of 2021, there's a private equity company that came along they liked what we were doing. They liked our email open rates. They liked um, the whole vision that we had. 
And one of the things that we were really interested in with Verbella was the opportunity of where VR technology could go. Um, good software for what we needed, but we saw a few key things that we could really, really emphasize and enhance. We were like, okay, this is something we got an opportunity on. When we first saw it in 2020, we didn't have the capital. We didn't have the contacts. We we're like, okay, put it off to the side for now, but we want to revisit that later. When the private equity company came along and we merged with them. That gave the capital injection. Then we were able to find a few people. Um, I had a great connection in California who knew the software team that we ended up using. So then in, I believe it was March, we officially finalized the terms, we officially got the new organization started, the Elevator Club, and we're custom coding a, a metaverse specifically for small businesses while providing those core essential back office duties, you know, the accounting, the bookkeeping, fractional CFO services, marketing, merchant processing, all those things that every business needs to have, yeah. we're able to provide it and to free them to focus on, on what they do and what they love doing. A lot of detail that goes into that story, but that's the that's the overall synopsis. <laughs> no, I love it. Thank you for like diving into that. And for people who don't know what the metaverse is, because that's something fairly new, people know about it, but maybe not. What does that look like for you guys? So that's a very uh, fascinating open-ended discussion. I'm going to narrow it down. So metaverse is a very, very broad term that people use uh, in different ways. So in our specific situation, metaverse to us means a virtual world. We're creating a virtual world that will help SMBs run their businesses more effectively and more efficiently using VR technology. Um, so we're starting off with a computer app and we have some fun, fun things in the works on where we go. But the idea is that we create this metaverse, this virtual world that will help small businesses make better decisions, help them set the proper framework for their business, cut costs, improve revenue by enhanced ad placement. Um, the list goes on and on, but that's what our metaverse is centered around. There are a lot of metaverses out there currently. Um, it's kind of like a cryptocurrency network. Or there are many, many different options to choose from. At the end of the day, only a few are going to make it. Um, and so we believe very firmly that we've positioned ours for a niche market that will support a lot of SMBs. Yes, no, and you're absolutely right. I think it's so important that you are supporting small businesses because when you just said the 12% of businesses don't have the things that are so important to have in place, the business plan, your avatar, like all the factors, like knowing your finances, just being able to grow. It's so true. It's so true. I think that's uh, something else that often gets lost, even though I'm, I would say most of everyone knows it now. The small business of fewer than 20 employees employs like 98% of all American workers. We all like to think of the really large companies that have thousands upon thousands of employees. And don't get me wrong, we need them too. But in terms of overall employment, the small business is where it's at. I think there are about 32, maybe 33 million businesses in the U.S., 30, 30, almost 31 have fewer than 20 employees. The vast majority of employment in the United States comes from the small business. As the small business goes, so goes the American economy. If the small business struggles, we're all going to struggle. Whereas if they thrive, we all thrive. So if we can help that small business succeed, it's good for everybody. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And that goes back to just being able to uplift each business and seeing them grow. But also a lot of times people just don't have the tools or the knowledge to be able to grow their business. They want to, but it's just their hands are so tight, especially if they have less than 20 employees. It's so true. I think you bring up a great point there. Most small business owners don't get into starting a business because they like business. They love what they do. They love the operations. Um, the HVAC technician that starts his own HVAC business, they love HVAC. The baker that starts a, you know, his or her own baking company, they love the baking process. It's not that they love the accounting or the management most small business owners, and there are studies out there on this. Most yeah. small business owners don't do it for the business back office duties. No. They love what they do and they want to be able to do it freely. They want to be independent. They want to obviously provide for their families, but they want to sustain without having to um, necessarily report to someone above them. They want to control their own destiny, but within that context of what they love doing. Mm -hmm. And that's where we feel like we can really service them. And I think we as a culture really need to continually emphasize how important it is to support that small business. Yeah, I hear you. And I just even like my own background, like I didn't get into business to do all the back end stuff. Like I have no desire to do it. Like, do I know how to do it? Yeah. Do I want to do it? No. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And you know what's funny about that too? With the proper financial plan, you can literally quantify and say, my time is worth this. It's better spent doing what I love because I'm so dang good at it 
no one can do it better than I can. But that means that you won't, you know, obviously only have 24 hours in the day, but you can literally say it's worth my time and worth my money to outsource this service or outsource that responsibility, delegate, so on and so forth. But yeah, I could, I can get wound up. Sorry. (laughs) No, no, no. I appreciate it. And I think too, it goes back to like, just being able to know your lane and stay in that lane too, because when we're able to quantify like what we can do, we can also outsource it or have services like yours and be able to have that support that is needed needed to continue to grow the business. Absolutely. Um, there's an old saying that a smart man learns from his mistakes, but a wise man learns from the mistakes of others. So <laughs> I've sometimes I've been a smart man, but I'd rather be a wise man. But we want to yeah. help the small business owner achieve that as well. I mean, obviously I've made mistakes in my career. I'm sure you've looked back and you're like, dang, I wish I wouldn't have done that. You know, yeah. hindsight's 2020. But if you can pass that on to someone and say, hey, here are things that I've done personally or that I've seen and learned from. Mm-hmm don't make this mistake or here's something that works really, really well. Make this a habit. That's how you can build that sustainable habit of success because success does become a habit. Yeah. And speaking of mistakes, what are some lessons that you've learned along this journey that you wish you would have known in the beginning? Oh my goodness. Lessons learned. I think one of the important ones is Mm -hmm. when you first start Endeavor, it's going to be super, super exciting. The first three, six months, you're going to be riding a total high, but Mm -hmm. it is imperative that you establish the long-term vision of where you want to go. If it's all about the money, it's not going to sustain you because there are going to be shorter paths there. Some of them get unethical and you really got to watch that. But having a strong vision is absolutely essential. That, you know, Mm -hmm. that, that big idea that drives you, you've got to have that. And then you've got to be ready for the dark time, so to speak. Um, What we found for a lot of our clients, and this is true for me as well, experienced it personally, months seven through 12 to 18, depending upon your industry and growth rate, Mm -hmm. it's dang, dang hard. Um, There's a lot of self-doubt, self-questioning. Hey, did I make the right call? Am I fit for this? You know, all the self-reflection that starts collapsing in on you, you start questioning and doubting yourself. That's all normal. Um, It's a very difficult part of the journey. But looking back, had I known a lot of that would be normal, definitely uh, would have helped me like, okay, this is something that's temporary. Everybody goes through it. There is the other side. You just have to continue to keep pushing. Um, that was definitely something I, that I wish I would have known back then. I appreciate you bringing that up because it, it's also like hindsight's twenty twenty. but being able to like push through that and knowing that feelings are temporary or feeling like sometimes like I know in the beginning I felt like inadequate or didn't feel like, okay, can I really do this? And kind of to what you're alluding to as well, it's just that moment. But if you can get past that, you can see the light or being able to reach out and knowing that you're not alone. Absolutely. Way. Absolutely. And I think having milestones help as well. Mm-hmm. That keeps yeah. you on the right path going forward because there's a big, big difference between quitting and changing direction. There's yeah. nothing wrong with a pivot. And if you're not quitting, but you're changing direction substantially, that doesn't necessarily mean it's a failure. That means you found a problem that required a solution to go a different direction. Yeah. That's not necessarily a bad thing either, which again, it goes back to that vision. Is that specific decision or action bringing you closer to your end goal. If the answer is yes, you're headed in the right direction. May not be an easy road, but at least you're moving in the right direction. Well said. (laughs) Uh, And just kind of looking at your journey, what has been maybe one or two roadblocks that really almost made you stop or almost like outside of the self-reflection piece or just the doubt that you really were able to push through? So somebody listening that might feel like, oh, this isn't working out. There are definitely going to be slow times. Uh, it may not be cyclical. It could be totally random, um, especially early on in the merchant processing space. There are days and weeks where you're like, shoot, we should have had, you know, three, four, five sales by now. We're looking to close one. What the heck is going on? Yeah. Sometimes things pile up and back up. And this goes back to the importance of having a structure in place. You need to have the productivity measurements. If you If your business is based on cold calls or face-to-face meetings or networking or digital ad spend, break it down into a daily. And if you can hourly, make it very granular hourly ratio to where I need to be doing this every hour or every day. Then obviously you have your weekly, monthly, so on and so forth. But having that set in place uh, is a huge help because then you can at least say, I'm doing what needs to be done. I'm pretty darn sure the theory is solid. Give it time. As long as you're hitting your productivity measurements and KPIs, 
it's going to turn around. You'll see, and this is something I saw personally, it'd be dry spells. I'm like, I'm doing everything I need to be doing. What's going on? And then it would all come through in one big rush within a matter of a week. And I'd be right back on schedule. Mm -hmm. It's the darndest thing. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. I appreciate you bringing that up. And I wanted to ask you, because I know the club has been re doing really well. You've been helping so many small business owners. Can you give us maybe one or two um, success stories that you've had recently that you would love to share with us today? So I've got one that's particularly exciting. I always enjoy telling. Um, yeah. Single mom up in Chicago. Mm -hmm. um, very similar story to all small businesses out there. Uh, she had a gift for making cupcakes. And she was like, you know what? I'm going to start making this a thing. I'm going to take this to the next level and make it a business. So she started, I think it was in 2017, kept pounding and pounding and really just pushing the grind, reaching out to people. And she wasn't afraid to dream small. She reached out to some very large companies. So then literally, I think it was in 20, early 2022, late 21, somewhere around there, American Airlines reached out to her and said, hey, we've been following you. We've you know, got your request for business. We want to work with you. And they placed a huge order, a huge long-term contract, the, like perfect scenario. The problem is she was literally baking outside of her house. <laughs> so she like didn't have the production capacity. She didn't have the equipment. She's like, okay, this is awesome. But this is a big challenge now. I got to deliver. So she would go, anyone would, she goes to the bank and the bank couldn't help her because she didn't fit in a regulatory box. So she came to Elevair. And we were able to provide all the back office solutions, including alternative lending. So we were able to bridge her funding, provide her essential CFO services and a few other things as well. But we were able to fund her to get her going, to get the equipment, get her producing. Um, and it's worked out great for her. I mean, so she went from literally baking out of her house to having a full-blown facility, got a great uh, contract with American Airlines, and United is pushing after her, Starbucks is looking to work with her. Um, so that's definitely the favorite success story. Uh, that's an amazing story. I, I'm so proud of her. I don't even know her, but like, it's just amazing. Like being able to have the resources that you guys do provide and being able to trust herself and create such an amazing contract. And for her though, having the, the stick to itiveness to keep at it, because you know, she started this several years ago, it took three, four years to really get the big opportunity. And I think that's something else that really a lot of small business owners are lose sight of going, I'm going to be multimillionaire in six months. Well, I'm all for the optimism, but you also have to balance it with reality. Build that financial forecast, set reasonable metrics and KPIs. Mm -hmm. Then you can kind of see where you're going, how long it'll take you to get there. I mean, she had to really pound the pavement for quite a long time mm -hmm. and it came to fruition, but good things take time. That's true. You know, I'm guilty as charged. I was like, oh, the one I started my business, I was like six months. Yeah, I'll be a millionaire. No. <laughs> we all, and that's part of the enthusiasm of a small business owner. And having that optimism is a good thing. You just oh, have yeah, to, yeah. When, you're, when you're playing with your life savings or you're investing mm -hmm. with other people's money, if you're raising capital, you need to have a definitive plan and try to bring it back down to earth a little bit and say, okay, this is where I can go best case, but based upon data that's already out there, based upon data that I personally recorded and seen in my existing business, or maybe I've gotten it from other friends and family that have started their own businesses. Mm -hmm. We're in the age of information. The data is out there. Yeah. Taking a little bit of time to look at that, to build a solid plan is so helpful. Mm -hmm. It is. It just makes sense. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's one of those funny things. Um, I, so I would go off on a tangent here. I'm an yeah. avid college football fan. Mm -hmm. um, and years ago, Penn State was revered, uh, revered as like one of the most successful football programs. Every year, kind of like, you know, the Alabama today, they would have a championship caliber team. And they played such boring football. It was pro style offense. It was 4-3 defense. No fancy blitz schemes. No Tampa 2. None of that. And they asked that coach, they are like, okay, what the heck is your deal? I mean, every year you have a, an incredible team, but you're boring. And he goes, that's it. We just do all the little things well. And it stuck with me. They didn't make mental mistakes. They had like maybe one penalty a game, but it was never like a mental false start penalty or offsides. Yeah. It was like a debatable holding call or something. Mm -hmm. No mental mistakes. They didn't turn the ball over. They didn't miss tackles. They just played sound football. And I think business is very similar to that. Very few yeah. businesses need the real elaborate, highly complex gadgets and gizmos and financial tools and all that. At the end of the day, do your business well and you're going to be fine. That might take a little time to build up there, but do the little things right and the big things will come together. And there was just one of those funny examples where I, I've yeah. seen it in business personally and then you know, really seeing it in like something like college football is like, okay, that's like one of those sound philosophies that works across all industries. 
Yeah, no, I, I love that example because it really does go back to the basics. When you have that foundation, you can just grow from there. And it is those little steps that make all the difference. You're not going to go v- from zero to a hundred. It's going to be zero to maybe 10 or to 11. Like it's those tiny steps. I love that. Especially for startups, especially for startups. Mm-hmm. Spot on. And so if you could give individuals a t- like two to three tips of what you wish you would have known when you started that really would have helped you continue to grow businesses and really be able to be growing just the community as well in the community? Oh my goodness. Oh, I was really blessed to have people pull me on the right track at a really early stage. So while I lost a little bit of time, I didn't thankfully lose, you know, like years getting connected to your community um, is huge. Don't wait on that. Whether it's a networking group, a church group, a chamber of commerce, Find one group that you make your peep, so to speak. Um, really dig in and make that your make that your tribe. If you do that, you'll get connected. You'll meet people you need to meet. You'll, there's also real great passive marketing. You'll build relationships, and it will help get you to where you want to go. Um, understand, especially for a startup, it's going to take time. If you're buying an existing business, that can be a game changer. Most people don't start off like that. Most business owners start from the ground up. Mm-hmm. realize that it's going to take time. They definitely have the optimism, you know, that go get it mentality, you know, the sky's the limit optimism, but balance it with reality and just give yourself time and be ready for the dark days. Um, there are going to be days that are very, very lonely, very depressing, but realize that's part of the journey. I mean, that's one blessing and curse of being a business owner. It's like, you know, you're not nine to five, but you are 24 seven. It, it, everything has its pros and cons. And then build a very realistic financial plan, know how much money you need, know where it's coming from, know how you're going to deploy it before you pull the trigger on anything. That would be the first thing I would suggest. Get into the nitty gritty, make it granular, test your hypothesis. Why do you think you're going to have X sales? How many products or services is it going to take to get there? How many do you have the capacity to do that? That will help you A, avoid a bad decision and B, avoid bad timing. The top two reasons businesses go under is because they're undercapitalized and they have no plan. You can solve both of those problems with literally starting off with a financial plan, building a business plan, looking at your budget, the the initial capital investment, the fixed ongoing monthly costs, and then you can look at the variable costs and calculate your break even. But doing all of those things will help get you on the right path if you're not doing it already. And if you're looking at starting a business, it will ensure you start off on the right foot. Mm. Those are such wise tips. <laughs> if we all knew this in the beginning, right? Sometimes you have to stub your toe, bump your knee to learn on personal experience. Just a few times. <laughs> back to the whole community part. Yeah. I was blessed um, um, with great, great parents. My dad's an entrepreneur. Um, he bought a company maybe 26 years ago. It was his first one that he really got going, got bought into, built it up, sold it later on, started a biotech company after that. Um, so he let me watch a lot of what he did and I, ta- I got to learn a lot through osmosis and I learned, I continually lean on him for different things. And then connecting to your community, you'll meet other entrepreneurs to uh, learn their journeys, what they did, what worked for them, what didn't. Yes, technology changes. Yes, industries change, but business is business. I mean, it's shocking how uniform it is. It doesn't matter if you're manufacturing or tech or logistics, transportation, what have you. At the end of the day, it's all business. Yeah, it is. At the end of the day, it is. And it's true. I just like kind of looking at other people and I've spoken to so many different amazing entrepreneurs like yourself, but really being able to understand too, there's differences, but like the core foundation seems to repeat itself, like the common themes of just what is so important. And you touched on so many of those things. It's so true. And one more, I think the one Mm -hmm. of the most, if not the most important part, you got to have the passion for it. If the passion, like we were talking earlier, is just mm-hmm. money, don't start a small business because it's going to take a long time to get to that financial goal that you have. I'm, mm-hmm. You need to make money in a small business. We all know that. We're all for it. That Otherwise, mm-hmm. we go under. Okay. But if there isn't a bigger vision behind it, it won't work. And there are many examples of that throughout history. You've got to have that strong why. If you get the strong why, you have the passion, you do the little things right, the money will come. You just have to work it. Exactly. (laughs) And speaking of working, just really towards that vision, and we're going to jump into the rapid fire questions if you're ready for them. (laughs) Ready when you are. What motivates you to work smarter? 
what motivates me to work smarter? I think one of the biggest things, obviously, you know, I'm married, so I want to want to impress the missus, want to bring home, you know, some good things for her, <laughs> but also knowing that I have limited time. Um, mm -hmm. No matter what happens, we all only have 24 hours in a day. There are very few opportunities where you can literally buy time. Yeah. Make the most of every minute. You've got to work smarter. Yes, work hard, but if it's not working smart, it's not going to be any good. You are exactly right. <laughs> And if you had to share a meal with any four individuals, living or dead, who would they be? Oh, okay. This was, this one's a really good one. I would say one, I'm, I'm a born again Christian. So having a conversation with Jesus in person um, with him physically would be fascinating. You talk about someone who lived like an incredible life. That'd be incredible to hear from him, like face to face like that. I think someone like George Washington founding a country uh, a lot of people don't remember that he was actually in the British Army for a while. I um, mean, very uh, well-respected soldier. Uh, so he saw both sides. Seeing how a country was started um, would be incredible. Abraham Lincoln bringing a, a country back together after the Civil War. Um, what it takes to do that, that would just be a fascinating discussion. And someone like a, a Tony Robbins type of person mm -hmm. would be fascinating. Someone who has such a strong, positive outlook who literally you cannot catch him down for one second. You're just like, okay, what's the deal? <laughs> How are you doing that? That <laughs> energy, the positivity. I think people, those four individuals, having their, their backgrounds, having their perspective on things, you would just learn so much. Yeah, no, that would be a fascinating meal <laughs> to join. <laughs> it would be, it would be. And what is the most daring thing you've ever done? Proposed. <laughs> so it's funny, I'll, I'll list two for you. Once the proposal, it was, even though I knew my wife would say, would say yes, there's still something incredibly nerve-wracking about getting down on the knee. You're like, okay, I'm putting everything I've got on the line here. Oh, yeah. That was definitely a nerve-wracking moment. I think it. <laughs> Uh, another one would be running for county judge. I ran for county judge this past mm -hmm. spring. Um, and it's definitely a moment of vulnerability sticking your neck out. But um, yeah. those are probably the two most daring things. Definitely. Definitely daring. <laughs> I can't imagine on the other side, but like for the proposal aspect, but I'm sure it's nerve wracking. But also just putting yourself out there as well, like judge wise. And like, um, you just never know what's going to happen. <laughs> this is true. <laughs> uh, what is the phone app that you use the most? So this is one, I like to be analytical. I like my data, right? Yeah. Instagram. Instagram mm -hmm. is the one I statistically spend the most time on. And I think one of the reasons that really brings me to Instagram is the diversity of content. You have picture, you have video, you have reel. You can scroll very quickly. You get a lot in a short amount of time. My feed, maybe I think I have credit to Instagram for having a really good algorithm. Obviously, I get to see what my friends are posting, but then I also get things that are important to me and what I look for in business for like research. So it's like almost like a news timeline in yeah. that regard. Um, but yeah, I digress. Instagram. <laughs> Instagram's a good one. <laughs> and what's your favorite way to spend a day off when you're not working, you're not run helping all these businesses? <laughs> if it's in the fall, it's got to have college football. But assuming because right now it's summer, it's not fall, we don't have college football yet. I love to work out. Uh, so getting a workout in the gym, lifting some weights, and then hitting the pool, getting a suntan with the wife, that's like the perfect day. You go get a good chest arm workout, you get a suntan, you dip in the pool. It's like, okay, this is just heaven on earth. Especially being in Texas. <laughs> a little toasty in the summers, but yes. <laughs> a little too. Um, what is something an outsider wouldn't know about your industry? I would say how competitive it is mm -hmm. and how, um, what would be the right way to say it? how little things and little differences make huge impact. Um, I would bring it back to the cryptocurrency analogy. Mm -hmm. there, I don't think people realize how many metaverses there actually are. There are so many of them, but I, most of them are scams. There are a few legit ones that have either NFT, um, patent, patented technology or blockchain technology, proprietary uh, backing of some sort. Mm -hmm. that gives a that gives solid valuation to it that gives a reason to invest yeah. um but i would say that what people don't realize is how competitive it is and how many options there are out there most people don't realize that that's true yeah and you never know what you're gonna get so it's important to do your own research everyone <laughs> this is true this is true <laughs> um but john i've so been enjoying this conversation where can people find you find everything you're up to we're gonna link everything below but if you could let us know too Absolutely. Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, um, website, elevateclub.com. Uh, my email should be below as well. My Instagram or Facebook page, 
if you have any questions, please feel free to shoot me a message, an email. I'm more than happy to help if there's anything that I can do. Um, I come from a small business background, a small business family. It's near and dear to my heart. So if there's anything I can do to help, just reach out and let me know. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, John, for sharing all your wisdom of all your experiences too when it comes to small business owners, but really just helping the community grow and understand all the ins and outs of how it can be really hard in the beginning, but doesn't have to be as hard if you have the support and the community. So thank you so much, John, for being here today. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Caroline. It's a pleasure. Absolutely. Make sure to like, subscribe, comment below. What was the biggest takeaway from John? I'm sure he would love to see that comment and we'll see you on the next video.